Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Jesus has entered the Jewish capital of Jerusalem. He's ridden in triumphantly on a donkey with the common people praising God, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah. But quickly, other voices are heard as the Pharisees complain about the noise of the crowds. Later, the chief priests and the teachers of the law raise their voices and question Jesus' authority, or more accurately, challenge his authority, especially after he has cleared the temple of money changers. Nevertheless, Jesus teaches the people in the temple courts. They listen, but more religious leaders, this time the Sadducees, spar with him. Jesus, however, continues to teach with authority. This is the backdrop for today's gospel lesson from Luke. And in the passage we heard just read, Jesus is making it clear that those who choose to follow him, those who are or will become his disciples, those who commit their lives to serving him by obeying his teachings and following his example, will also likely follow his example when it comes to experiencing persecution. You will be hated by all because of my name, Jesus warns his disciples. Thank God that's not the final word, though, as Jesus also points out that God remains and always will be in control. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls, Jesus says. Being a follower of Jesus isn't for sissies, especially if you're willing to take your faith seriously, to be all in for Jesus. Last Sunday, in the first sermon of this three-part series on the capitals of Methodism, that's my expression, not an official title, we focused on how John Wesley and others, including his brother Charles, went all in for Jesus when they were at Oxford. What we're going to see today is that Jesus' words of warning to his disciples about likely persecution would ring true in John Wesley's life as well. Now, sometimes our battles come from where least expected, hence the expression with friends like these, who needs enemies? All of us, I'm sure, have had those experiences when we felt broadsided by somebody considered a friend but who behaved more like an enemy. Wesley probably felt that at Oxford when students made fun of the small group of which he and Charles were a part, calling them names such as the Holy Club or, shudder at the thought, Methodists. John Wesley would also experience persecution, or at least opposition, when he later traveled to the American colony of Georgia, where he hoped to convert Native Americans to Christianity. There in Savannah, many of the English colonists, whom you would think would welcome him in his ministry, wanted little or nothing to do with him. Now, there were a few reasons why Wesley wasn't such a big hit with many of his own people, and he may have had something to do with that. One was what happened when he arrived when he confiscated and destroyed all of the rum carried on the ship that had sailed across the Atlantic. Evidently, it was for the ship's passengers, many of whom were heading to Savannah, so they could celebrate their arrival in the New World. That's not exactly the best way to ingratiate yourself with your new neighbors. The second factor was Wesley's very disciplined approach to Christian living, which included 5 a.m. daily prayer services. Now, if that weren't enough, the problem was that he denied Holy Communion to anyone who didn't attend. John Wesley was strict in his daily walk of faith, and he expected others to be as well. Now, while his motive was unquestionably pure and good, his bedside manner, so to speak, may have been a little lacking. Journal entry of Wesley's from 1736 reveals the level of opposition he faced from some, as he reported what one colonist told him. I like nothing you do. Indeed, there is neither man nor woman in the town who minds a word you say. And so you may preach long enough, but nobody will come to hear you. As I pointed out at 8.30, I'm a little reluctant to share that quote with you because it may come back. 
wasn't always easy for John Wesley, nor, was, nor is it always for us either. But based on our gospel lesson, maybe we shouldn't expect it to be. Sometimes, now we do bring problems on ourselves, but other times they find their way to us because of whom we identify with and worship. As already noted, Jesus said, you will be hated by all because of my name. Struggle inevitably seems to be a companion on our faith journey. With that in mind, I want to turn now to another time in Wesley's life and ministry when he faced opposition because of Jesus' name and because of his role as a preacher of the gospel. In May of 1738, Wesley had an experience, which we'll spend more time on next Sunday, that gave him much greater evangelistic, evangel evangelical zeal than he had had before. That's the upside. It had another side, however, one that presented some challenges for him. Wesley became so passionate in his preaching that he was often labeled as an enthusiast, which in proper English society of that day was definitely not a compliment. He was seen by many as fanatical, zealous to an obnoxious degree, so that by the end of the year only five Anglican churches in London welcomed him into their pulpits anymore. I need to explain something here. You may recall from last Sunday that John Wesley was an Oxford fellow. Most fellows are ordained, were ordained priests in the Church of England. The church divided up England into parishes, each of which had a church served exclusively by a priest. Fellows, however, were not appointed to parishes, yet they frequently preached at parish churches by the invitation of the rector or the pastor in charge. As Wesley's growing reputation and uh, as an overly zealous preacher preceded him, more and more of those parish church pulpits were closed to him. Supporters of Wesley, not surprisingly, saw things a little differently. They didn't consider him a fanatic, but rather inspired and appropriately passionate in his preaching to people who were far too tepid in their faith. 18th century England was ripe for revival, and Wesley was seeking to breathe new life into the church through his sermons and in Methodist society meetings. But it wasn't always an easy path to follow. It's interesting, though, how roadblocks in life can often lead to detours that ultimately yield great blessings. In March 1739, Wesley received a letter from George Whitfield that would act as a detour sign and take him to such a great a place of great blessing of, for the burgeoning Methodist movement. Whitfield had joined the Methodist Bible study and prayer group at Oxford in 1735, just before the Wesleys left the university. When John Wesley was away in America for roughly two years, Whitfield was preaching an evangelical gospel to the Methodist societies in London and all across England. In March 1739, when he wrote to Wesley to visit him, Whitfield was in Bristol a city of about 50,000, today it's about a million, in, the south, in southwest England. It was a seaport where trade ships came and went, unfortunately including slave trading ships. Coal mining was a major industry to the east of Bristol outside the village of Kingswood. And Whitfield, because of the evangelical style of his sermons, had been barred like Wesley from preaching at many of the parish churches. So in addition to delivering sermons in the society meeting houses, he was also preaching outdoors. Now this would be a shock to Wesley when he arrived in Bristol. In his journal he wrote that he could, scarcely reconcile, he could scarce reconcile himself at first to this strange way of preaching in the fields. And that for most of his life he had been so tenacious of every point relating to decency and order that he should have thought the saving of souls almost a sin if it had not been done in a church. It wasn't illegal to preach outdoors, it just wasn't done and was connected with heretics. On Sunday, April the 1st, 1739, interestingly enough, the scripture for Wesley's message was from the Sermon on the Mount, which he would recognize as one pretty remarkable precedent of field preaching. That's his quote. Later that day, he witnessed George Whitfield preach to 30,000 people. 30,000, can you imagine? And this is what he wrote about it later. At four in the afternoon, I submitted to be more vile, he put that in quotes, and proclaimed in the highways the glad tidings of salvation, speaking from a little eminence in a ground adjoining to the city to about 3,000 people. 
From that point on, John Wesley continued to engage in what was called field preaching, even though it wasn't always in the field. Any spot outside could work, such as market squares, which often had a cross in the center on, on pillars, and he would stand on those steps, Wesley would, to deliver the sermons, including in his hometown of Epworth, by the way, which I was able to see when I was there. He also found graveyards, very suitable locations for preaching, with the church building acting as a backdrop that projected the sound out toward the crowds. Opposition to Wesley's preaching within other pastors' parishes persisted, including by the curate of the church at Epworth, where his father had been the rector for decades. The curate wouldn't allow him to preach from the church's pulpit, so Wesley preached from the graveyard next to the church, standing atop his father's grave. Wesley preached to many thousands at a time. In and around London, crowds would range from 12 to 20,000. And yet he was not universally welcomed wherever he preached. Over the years, he suffered beatings, harassment, and having eggs, rotting vegetables, and even rocks thrown at him. He never gave up, though, because of his sincere desire to share the good news of Jesus Christ to all who could hear it, wherever they were, including outside the walls of the church. As Wesley and others in the Methodist movement formed societies in Oxford, Bristol, London, and elsewhere, priests protested their presence and called for Wesley to stay out of their parishes. The rector of All Saints Church in Bristol attacked Wesley and Whitfield in the newspaper. John Wesley wrote to the priest and later to the bishop with words similar to what he had used in a previous letter to a friend. God has called me to preach the gospel, and as a fellow of a college, my ordination is not to any particular parish but to any part of the Church of England. Therefore, my ministry is not limited by parish boundaries, but I look upon all the world as my parish. In the prior letter to his friend, he had added, Thus far I mean that in whatever part of it I am, I judge it meet right in my bounden duty to declare unto all that are willing to hear the glad tidings of salvation. This underscores what was behind Wesley's evangelistic zeal, why he was undeterred by the opposition he received and even willing to endure physical abuse. He sincerely believed at the very core of his being in the message he was charged to convey, that Jesus Christ died for the sins of all persons and that in him we all have hope and life. In commenting on today's gospel text from Luke and Jesus' warning about the opposition his followers would experience, Alan Culpepper writes, the gospel offers not a way of predicting the end of the world, which is what many Christians do seem to be searching for, but he says the spiritual responses to cope with adversity and hardship. He concludes, truth is tested and faith is confirmed not in idle speculation, but in the crucible of adversity. Those who wish to find a more vibrant religious experience, therefore, should not look for signs of the future, but for signals that it is time to live by Jesus' call for obedience here and now. John Wesley lived that way. He truly lived that way. He sought to be obedient to Christ in all that he did and said, including in his preaching, such that he was willing to be more vile and preach outdoors, in the fields, in the marketplaces, in the graveyards, if that's what it took to get the good news to those who needed to hear it. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 10, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You might be interested in knowing that Wesley's field preaching didn't involve altar calls. According to Adam Hamilton, that didn't exist until Charles Finney started them in the 1800s during his revivals. Instead, worshipers were invited by Wesley to, intend to attend a Methodist society meeting, which then propelled them forward in the process of sanctification that we looked at last week. A distinctive characteristic of us Methodists from the start was a belief in the long-term nurturing of one's faith. 
course, with thousands hearing the persuasive preaching of Wesley and Whitfield in the fields, the Methodist societies, which had been meeting in homes, just like first century churches, were swelling in numbers. In May of 1739, just two months after Wesley had arrived, the two largest societies in Bristol, those meeting on Nicholas and Baldwin Streets, worked together to purchase land for constructing a building big enough for both societies. John Wesley assisted them financially and thus assumed some control over the meeting house. It came to be known as the New Room and was the first headquarters of the Methodist movement. And the two societies merged to become the United Society. So you can see why Bristol might be considered one of the capitals of Methodism, to use my phrase. The new house, by the way, still stands. And I had the pleasure of touring it while in Bristol. Upstairs is a museum that includes the room used by John Wesley as an apartment. Let me just say, it's really cool. <laughs> Last Sunday, we talked about sanctifying grace how the Holy Spirit works within us to transform our hearts and our minds and draw us into a closer relationship with God through Christ. For the thousands of non-Christians who heard Wesley preaching the gospel in the fields and elsewhere, the message he would want them to hear was about another form of God's grace, justifying grace. This is God's action in Jesus Christ on the cross for us that frees us from the burden of sin and death. For Wesley, it was all about forgiveness. Thought about that as we were singing the last hymn, It is well with my soul, even though this was written 150 years later. The third stanza, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Wesley, I think, would have approved very much of that hymn. Justifying grace is a free gift that we can receive only by faith, not by any works or action on our part. As the writer of Ephesians says, in which John Wesley cited numerous times in sermons, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. And such faith is not mere belief in Jesus Christ as revealed in the, in the scriptures. It's that in part, but not only that, but also trust in him as Lord and Savior. Another way of putting it is to say that it's understanding that you're loved by God. Not because of who you are, but because of who God is, because God is love. And because of that love, he makes us his children. John Wesley devoted his life to spreading this good news. After his first field preaching experience in Bristol in April 1739, and for the next 52 years, it's estimated that Wesley traveled by foot, by horse, and in his later years by carriage, some 250,000 miles preaching that God's grace is a free gift available to all persons. I think that's 10 times around the earth, isn't it? It's amazing. He delivered an average of 15 sermons per week for a total of over 40,000. He even had a traveling pulpit on wheels. And I don't know if he had more than one, but there's one on display at the World Methodist Museum at Lake Junaluska. It's really cool. And by the power of God, the Methodist movement spread across England and beyond, reaching our shores and all around the world, transforming the hearts and minds of individuals, and improving the fabric of 18th century British society. Bristol is where it blossomed. Wesley gave so much of his life to proclaiming the free gift of God's grace and its availability to all, even accepting something like outdoor preaching, which previously he had, been, he had seen as repugnant because he believed that it was far more important to reach the, la the least and the lost outside the church walls than to limit influence on those inside. While the situations are certainly not the same and it's open to argument whether or not they're sufficiently similar, maybe in the context of the debate going on in the United Methodist Church over the issue of a way forward, we at least ought to take a closer look at Wes Wesley's willingness to broaden his definition of what's acceptable under church practice. In his case, field preaching. It's at least something worth considering. 
given that it's part of our history and was a choice made by our founder that must not have been easy for him at first, but which he quickly embraced when he saw it as a way to draw more souls to Christ. However we might come down on that issue, one thing is for sure. John Wesley provides us with a powerful example of endurance in the face of opposition, consistent with what Jesus says in today's gospel lesson. Wesley remained faithful and obedient to Jesus Christ no matter what came his way, even though shunned by so many of his clergy colleagues. His passion for reaching all persons with the good news of God's free gift of grace compelled Wesley forward with a sense of urgency and you could even say bravery as he looked upon all the world as his parish. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.